Okay, perfect. Now they can read you. Okay. Good to go. John, do you think we can start? Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. hi, everyone. <laughs> hi, students. Hi, Giovanna. Uh, so, for today's uh, introductory, introductory session of this workshop, I'm going to present your faculty. She's Giovanna Daniels. She holds a PhD in plant pathology from Cornell University, an MSc in biological sciences, and a double major in biology and microbiology from Universidad de los Andes in Bogota, Colombia. She is currently an associate professor at Universidad de los Andes in the School of Architecture and Design. Her research and practice centers on biodesign with an interdisciplinary approach to education. Her teaching, advisory, and mentoring in biodesign resulted in a variety of projects, winning awards at the Biodesign Challenge from 2018 to 2022. In 2019, Joanna received the L'Oreal UNESCO Award for Women in Science in Colombia. She directs the Atavaga Uniandes Research Group, which strengthens elementary and secondary science, technology, engineer, and mathematics education through design thinking methodology. She is a member of three bio-based sustainable startups, NanoFreeze, a patented bio nanotechnology for cold chain refrigeration, eBiodyne, and Wokoa the Vegan Wool. So thank you, Shovana, for being here and the stage is yours. Thank you, Josefina, and welcome everyone. Um, I will first start with a presentation where I'll, where, I, where I'll explain who I am and what took me from biotechnology and uh, biological um, background to design and design thinking practices. And after this first hour, we will get to know each other. I, I will have a little slot of time for you to present yourself and what you have been working in this master's degree. So the course is design and biotechnology, and the idea is to understand why the bond between design and biotechnology is so essential today. So what took Giovanna to this biodesign um, now the career, and it was the biodesign challenge, which is a challenge that was created in 2016. We participated in 2017 for the first time as a university. And I was asked by the Dean of the School of Architecture and Design of, at Universidad de Los Andes if I could prepare design students to compete at this uh, competition. And since then I've become a biodesigner. So as Josefina mentioned, I'm a plant pathologist. I studied plant diseases. And for more than 10 years, I have been studying a disease called late blight disease caused by a pathogen called Phytopter infestans. If you have ever heard about the great Irish famine, this was caused by this same pathogen and today it's still a big problem around the world. And as a scientist, I had never asked myself if this is such an amazing pathogen, it has to have an enzymatic battery of proteins or metabolites that could be amazing for the industry. But as a scientist, I have a single focus and is how can I stop this pathogen from causing devastating diseases in the field? But there are other examples of plant diseases, such as this, um, which is called corn smut. And it's a fungus that replaces the grain in the corn and be begins to grow. So for for growers, this is a, a really devastating disease. They have to burn the whole crop. But in Mexico, they sell the fungus instead of the corn, which is called with la coche, and perhaps make a, a lot more money from it than they would have done by selling the, the corn. So what is a problem can turn into an opportunity if you find other ways of thinking about it. Wukoa is a, is a startup which began with the challenge of how to create vegan wool. So wool is an amazing fiber um, that has been used in the textile industry for, for centuries. And why, why did Stella McCartney, which is a, a famous sustainable fashion, 
fashion designer proposed to create a vegan wool is because industry has made the obtention of the wool something that is not um, ethical with the animals and with the industry because sometimes they just take the the wool without it being mature or high quality because it's become an industrialized industry so what the group of students decided to do was find out what makes wool such an amazing material and what they determined as and called it its nobility was that wool is a material that is able to keep heat to retain heat so people use it in, in cold weather uh, to keep themselves warm also it's something that is fabricated by small farmers and it has this social um this social background associated with wool. And third, it is something that feels soft. So what the students uh, first decided to look was, okay, we're in Colombia, which is a country that has a lot of different sources of fiber. And they started to look where could they find some fibers that could kind of um, behave as wool does so they found in coconut fibers something that could help retain heat and then they fought, found in hemp which not in hemp but in mar marijuana stems also something that could um, behave or or let's say accomplish that social um, background that wool had for them so in colombia they grow a lot of marijuana and and other um plants that are used for different purposes. And this could give them a, a let's say, a legal uh, reason of why to grow marijuana. And marijuana is a crop that requires less water, less pesticide than others, such as cotton. So what they did was blend coconut fibers with marijuana fibers. And it accomplished two of their, of their characteristics that was a social background and also something that could retain heat. But when they taught it, it didn't feel soft. It's, it felt rough. So this that I'm showing in this picture is a fungus called Pleurotus ostratus, which is a orellana. A, it's also known as orellana and, and it's an edible mushroom. And it has enzymes that have the capacity to, it has enzymes that, has the, that have the capacity to degrade wood or lignin, which is this a material or polymer in, in trees that is hard. So when they added the enzyme, which is called lacase, to the fiber, they could observe under the electron microscope, which is my next slide, oh, turn here, that it softened the fiber. So this is where biotechnology comes into play. Sometimes nature offers things. We could see waste, which is like coconut waste and hemp, uh, stems which are usually burnt they could instead be used to create new fibers but to accomplish this softness that is required we can apply enzymes that come from fungi so with this uh, project they received the first prize the first um, yeah prize at the, at the biodesign challenge for this challenge and they were able to visit uh, Stella McCartney's headquarters in the United Kingdom Another example of how plant pathology can help solve problems of humankind is this plant pathogen called Pseudomonas syringi. It's a bacteria. It's found worldwide. It's very, very common. And it has an, a, pro, a protein that is able to nucleate water. What that means is that it is able to freeze water molecules. And when the bacteria is inside the plant tissue, it breaks the plant tissue, allowing the bacteria to spread throughout the plant. So this is how it looks. And this is what causes frost in the air because the protein is volatile. So it's in the air. And when it's in contact with water molecules, it, freeze, it freezes them at positive temperatures. So you don't need really cold temperatures to create ice, but it could be at, at higher temperatures, at positive temperatures. 
So today, the protein, not the bacteria, is used to create snow in places where, where you ski. Sometimes it is not cold enough to create natural snow. So you, they create artificial snow by spreading the, the bacteria protein in the air. So what it does is nucleate the water and create artificial snow. So what the students, they became amazed with this technology and they were like, how can we all, how can we apply this technology in a different context? This is where design comes in. And they, they investigated and there is, was a context that was in need of a refrigerating system and it was for the transport tech, transportation of vaccines, particularly in rural areas in Colombia. So it is more common to find a refrigerator than it is to find a freezer in Colombia. So with this, with this protein, you could make ice at two degrees Celsius or at four degrees Celsius. So we could you create ice in a refrigerator and, and didn't have to use a freezer. And also because they're designers, they didn't just solve the problem, but they also thought about the context in a systemic way. And they accompanied people in these brigades uh, to, to apply vaccines to people. And they saw that the, the people went, went in motorcycles with this styrofoam uh, fridge. So they had really a very bad bad ache. And the vaccines were placed all around. And they broke sometimes because the street is not, it has holes and it's not like the most comfortable uh, route to go to, to these places. So they also created a backpack where they could store the vaccines uh, in a, a way that the person could open it and know exactly where it was. So they could be in contact with a uh, room temperature the least time possible and maintain the, the cold chain the best they could. So this was the, the, frid, the containers they created. And today, this is a startup uh, that that how that also has flexible fridges because with flexible fridges you could decrease costs in transportation decreasing also that that footprint that carbon footprint in transportation that is something that is very relevant today and you could also imagine ways of transporting vaccines vaccines using this technology using by by using drones so the combination between design and biology or biotechnology can really solve problems that, that we have today. Uh, they are called wicked problems, really complex problems. Okay, so this that you see in my background and also in this slide, who can tell me what, what this is? What do you think this is? Bacteria or mold? Yeah, so molds, they are fungi. They are fungi. And you can see fungi have diverse colors, diverse textures, and not only colors and textures, but also enzymes that can degrade things, that can change environments, that produce smell, and a lot of amazing different components. So with fungi, when I present fungi to designers, they become overwhelmed. They're like, what is this amazing uh, microorganism that I have in front of me. So usually microorganisms are seen in a negative way. They cause diseases, um, they smell bad, or they're, they're associated with problems. But whenever you see them and, and find it with a, like an opportunities view, you can find that they have a lot of different applications. So designers in a course I teach called Magical and Perverse Fungi use this to, to stain different textiles. And if you go and deepen into the dyeing industry, dyes contaminate a lot of water sources, use a lot of water, and, and you have to extract minerals and a lot of different things from nature in order to produce dyes. Instead, fungi reproduce themselves and at the same time they produce the, the dye. Another group of students applied this uh, colors and also a lot of uh, different properties that fungi have like nutraceutical properties to create eyelashes, eyelashes based on, on fungi. And, and this is something that can help protect skin that is created in a natural way and that people can actually do it, do it themselves and see how, how it, how it works. 
And then other things that fungi and bacteria can help us um, create alternatives to are, for example, this plastic. This is really common. I think everyone has played with this for a while and it's been very useful because it helps protect objects. But what happens? I buy something which is completely wrapped in this plastic and I throw it away and, and that plastic takes millions of years to degrade. And we usually give it a second um, use to the plastic. What if we can use a material that is created by nature? This is bacterial cellulose, which is created by a process of fermentation uh, between a symbiosis, a symbiotic between bacteria and yeast. So has someone tried kombucha? Yes. Yeah, okay, it's a tea. It's really, it's become famous lately because it has a lot of um, positive properties for health. But if you have ever grown your own kombucha at home, which it, it just requires tea and sugar and water, you'll see that this uh, pops out. Let me laser point here, this. This is called SCOBY, which means symbiotic colonies of bacteria and yeast. So through a process of fermentation, bacteria, uh, no, yeast turn the sugar into fructose or into more simple sugars that the bacteria then use to create acetic acid, which is vinegar, and bacterial cellulose. So cellulose is one of the most common molecules found throughout the world. All plants have cellulose. But the nice thing about this is that it's cellulose without any other components. So if I want to extract cellulose from a tree to create paper, for example, or other things, I would have to use chemicals to have the cellulose uh, alone and apart from other molecules. But here, it's just bacterial cellulose. And what the group of students did was dry that uh, SCOBY and then use it to create this kind of like a plastic use to wrap it up. And whenever you don't want to use it anymore, you could throw it away. And under, under co composting um, conditions, it could just return to nature and as, as a nutrient. Another really famous um, use is the polystyrene foam. We all use it. But again, we buy a computer, we buy a TV, and it's filled with all of this um, uh, material that we wrap it up. I think we take one minute to open our computer and like throw that away and it takes uh, a lot of time for it to come back to nature. What if we use mycelia, which are the little um, the, like roots that, that fungi have, which grows, it wraps up in agricultural waste and the mycelia starts to grow. And then we can put it in an oven and do things like this. So this is mycelium with, a, with agricultural waste. So again, if you don't wanna use it anymore, hopefully we give it second uses because that is the idea, like it, it required energy to create this. So we, if we can find a second use, that would be ideal. But if we don't, we can just return it to nature and it will turn into nutrients for the soil. And this is the, the example of when you buy the computers or furniture, it goes into the corner. So why use? polystyrene foam if you could use mycelia and agricultural waste. So the idea of this course started in, by taking into consideration that population is growing, right? The planet is not expanding. Like we are not having a, a larger planet with a larger population size. We need more food. We're consuming more, more of our natural resources. And there is something that has to change. So there, there are 17 uh, sustainable development goals that have been uh, set by the United Nations to try to have a more sustainable world, right? But the, the, it said the 2030, which is like seven years from now, are we really going to accomplish that in seven years? I don't know. So that combination between design and biotechnology 
is one of the ways we can help accomplish the sustainable development goals by using technology, but not technology alone, but applying design thinking tools to really understand what are the needs of people in their context and create solutions with the people. Because us as scientists, we work in labs, we can solve every problem, but a solution doesn't mean that it, it will cause a change. Because I, for example, I worked, as I told you, for 10 years on this, on these DTs, and I had a lot of really nice uh, insights, but that wouldn't mean farmers in Colombia would use it. Why? Because maybe they don't have the resources to apply my solution. They don't have the knowledge to apply the solution. So what I would have had to do is create the solution with them, not aside from them. And that is what biodesign tries to do, working with the context, with the communities to solve solutions and applying information that comes from science. So, for example, should we eat insects? And whenever we hear these things, sometimes what happens today is that people take this information and say, OK, we should all eat insects. That will also turn into a problem. These are alternatives. We have to be different. We have to find different alternatives. It doesn't mean we have to avoid meat. We have no, it's an alternative. And can people grow insects at home and produce their own food that could be our source of protein? So for some context, this could be a solution because some people don't have access to, to proteins like that, that could help in, in, to, in their nu nutrient uh, balance. So why not grow insects at home? There's also alternatives for vegan dairy because today we know how to make milk in a lab by using just enzymes and proteins. So bacteria can produce the enzymes that are originally produced by cows and we can make milk in a lab without the use of a cow. And these are alternative uh, dairy sources that could also help feed the world. Then there's another thing. Can we create meat substitutes? Yes, we can. There's the Impossible Burger today uh, where we can create meat by using uh, different uh, vegetable sources, but also we could create meat in a lab, like real meat, muscle, tissue. So like if you have heard that there's a, in, in the labs, you can create tissue like muscle, skin tissue. Have you seen like in Petri dishes where scientists, create and grow skin tissue, why not create muscles, right? So you can create muscle and that way you can, you can eat meat, real meat, but not created by a cow, but in a lab by a bacteria, okay? But this all sounds amazing, but we have to be really critical when we read the news because people talk about this meat as, as being a animal free. But if we see the process of how this meat is created, they also use things that, are, that come from, from animals. So for example, bovine serum. So they have to use a fetal, fetal a serum in order to grow these tissues in the lab. So it's not animal free at all, but it is a technology that it's advancing and that there's things that still have to work to make it animal free. But the message here is not that we have to stop growing cattle or we have to stop eating meat. What we have to think is creating alternatives so that we don't depend on a single source for the proteins, but we have alternatives and do not charge the planet as we're doing it today. Then there's other biotechnologies. And now with the COVID, uh, something that COVID has helped us is, is teach us about viruses. People didn't know about viruses in the past, but now we know viruses are, are common. And viruses are not only negative, they could also be positive because viruses are this, um, we, we don't call them living organisms because they depend on living organisms in order to survive. They do not survive on their own. So this is the, the big dilemma in biology. Are they living or are they not? So let's say they're not, but viruses, uh, are very specific. They attack cells that are very, very specific. So if there's a virus that attacks uh, a cat, probably it will not attack a human being. Sometimes there are some that can attack interspecies, but those are not very common. So there's some virus that can also attack bacteria cells. 
So we can use virus as antibiotics. And if you have heard today, there is a huge problem because we are, we are uh, living with bacteria that are resistant to multiple antibiotics. And there's no other alternative for those patients that are infected with this multi-resistant bacteria. So why not use viruses that can attack specifically those multi-resistant bacteria? That's an alternative. Another thing, another way we could use this virus, viruses is for example, if you buy fish or if you buy meat or, or, or any other protein source and you want to see if it is become a, infected with bacteria. You could have bacteria that help change color if, virus I mean, that can help change color if they detect the bacteria in your food. So it could be an alert system to let us know that bacteria are around and which type of bacteria, right? Because not all bacteria are bad, but we want to prevent those bacteria that cause stomach aches or other diseases in humans. So why biology and design? Our planet is 4.5 billion years old. And for 3.8 billion years, it has supported life. And since then, millions of organisms have adapted and evolved to meet their needs within this planet, creating a processes, living systems that are interconnected and complex. So the planet has already solved, for example, how to get water from, from the environment in, in ecosystems that are water is scarce. So for example, in deserts. And the amazing thing is that the planet doesn't have a single solution. You can find in multiple uh, animal species and also in plants that they have different solutions to obtain water or retain water from the environment in places where water is scarce. So if we understand the function that the, that the planet has prototyped and evolved through centuries, we could also create things that behave like nature. So there's two things we can do. We can use processes, components, organisms, or living systems or we can become inspired and understand how nature works and imitate it. So the first thing is called biotechnology, where we use living organisms, processes, or parts of living organisms. And then the second one is called biomimicry, where we learn about the functions that living organisms um, be, have in nature and then extract that function to create objects that behave like nature. So this can help us find solutions to complex problems, develop new products, processes, and systems, and also improve existing designs. So everyday examples of biotechnologies are bread, beer, wine. This all require organisms. Fermentation requires bacteria and yeast. So this is biotechnology because Sometimes when we use the word biotechnology, people become a little bit scared, like, no, that's very complex. Only a few people know how to do biotechnology. But I'm sure if you have ever done a pizza, if you have ever done a lot of different things that we usually do at home, we are applying biotechnology. So um, I apologize that this is in Spanish. It's, it's, it's from a book that I will share at the end. But some of the applications of biotechnologies are, for example, bioremediation. So we can use living organisms to remediate things that are in the environment. For example, when there's an oil spill in the ocean, we, can, we have heard about news that, the, that a boat was a, had a problem and the oil spilled in the ocean. So there's living organisms that are capable of eating this oil and transforming it into molecules that are more simple that then fish and plants can eat. And by in that, in that process, they remediate the soil. So there is microbial remediation, there is phytoremediation, which is remediation by plants, and there is microremediation, remediation uh, caused by a fungi. There's also a phycoremediation, which is a um, through algae. So depending on the living organism that is eating the complex molecule and turning it into more simple molecules, it's, it's how we remediate the plant. Then there's genetic engineering. So we know that all living organisms have a DNA code, right? 
every cell in our body has the same information. So you will, you may ask yourself, why if our, our, our cells in our eyes have the same information as our cells in our hair? Why do we have hair and why do we have eyes, right? So imagine like, Imagine that every cell has the same book with the same information. But in a tissue, I read certain chapters of the book. And in other tissues, I read other chapters of my book. So reading the genetic code is what at the end creates proteins. And proteins is what we can see, smell, or, or detect things. So depending on what we're reading is what we're expressing. So um, how... Can somebody tell me where the insulin that people that have diabetes apply themselves come from? Insulina, insulin. Do you know? Can you guess? Livestock, right? Cows. Okay. Real artificial. Okay. Today it's artificial, but in the past, people had to kill dogs or pigs to extract insulin from the pancreas. And that was the insulin that was injected in patients that had diabetes. Today, thanks to the access of reading the genetic code, we're able to know what is the code that expresses the insulin protein, the human insulin protein. And we can, we can synthesize the genetic code. I'll show you a video, but the DNA is sugar, basically sugar and other molecules. And we can, in a kind of like in a printer, print DNA. And that DNA can be inserted into a bacteria that then the bacteria reproduces. And while it's reproducing, it, it's producing the, uh, the insulin protein. And then we extract the protein and we put it in a vial. And that's what uh, patients with diabetes inject themselves today. So it's something that is genetically engineered, the insulin protein. It's created... The humans are the ones who created it in nature, but today bacteria are producing. It. So that's why it's genetically engineered. So this is the same thing. Bacteria have their chromosomes, but also bacteria have something that is very special called like extra chromosomes called plasmids, which are circular DNA. And in that circular DNA, you can insert any type of genetic information you want. So we could insert it, genes that code for colors, genes that codes for smell, genes that code for insulin, genes that codes for bioluminescence, anything you can think of can be inserted there. So we, in biotechnology, we have learned and we have tools that look like scissors. So we can have scissors to cut this plasmid. We have glue to paste DNA code into the plasmid. So anything you can imagine can be created through genetic engineering. And then through fermentation, we grow and multiply the bacteria so that bacteria will produce the protein of interest. So some applications can be colors. And there, this is a startup I am part of, eBioDye. So what we do is create um, dyes that through bacteria. So for example, there is a, a jellyfish that has this bioluminescent green fluorescent protein. And we know the gene for that green fluorescent protein. In, in biology, a lot, lot of, a lot of researchers use it to, to see what, what the genes are doing or to detect molecular things. So we insert the gene in a bacteria and then we multiply the bacteria and we can then stain a textiles. This is a Converse shoe, which is stained with this a dye produced by bacteria. And it has the, this fluorescent a type of, of behavior. We also have this. one, So it will help in the, in the industry, in the textile industry, because as I mentioned in the beginning of the presentation, dyes are highly, con highly con contaminate water sources and also people that are in the dyeing industry they have a lot of, of respiratory of, of breathing problems because of the toxic um, chemicals that are used to create so that is genetic engineering getting a gene that is already created in nature and making another organism produce it. but there's another thing we have today and it's synthetic biology 
So instead of just copying nature and producing it in another organism, we can imagine and create a different living organism. So imagine genes as, as Lego bricks. So we have a lot of different Lego bricks that produce smell, that produce color, that produce insulin and anything you can imagine. So what if we have a bacteria that is able to, to find or detect gold in soil and in case the bacteria detected gold, then that it could turn into a different color so that us humans can't see that the bacteria has just detected gold or um, sometimes any heavy metals that are contaminants, we can find, we can make bacteria detect these things and then turn into a different color or produce a certain smell. So us humans can't understand that the bacteria has actually detected what we wanted them to do. I'm gonna show you this video that illustrates what I'm talking about. Can you see? Okay. thousand years of genetic manipulation by selective breeding, humans finally gained direct access to the genetic code, deoxyribonucleic acid, DNA. Since then, we've cut and pasted it, photocopied fragments of it en masse, speed read it with sequences, printed out the code letter by letter in the lab, modeled it on computers and measured it with microscopes. For 40 years now, we've called this work genetic engineering. The trouble is that while there's been an extraordinary amount of genetic discovery and manipulation, there's been precious little engineering. Engineers are frustrated by genetics and molecular biology. The experiments are too slow, the complexity too messy and growing more so all the time. And there's a frustrating lack of standardized components. They'd like to do to genetic engineering what engineers have done since the Stone Age, collect, refine, and repackage nature so that it's easier to make new and reliable things. Engineers want to treat DNA more like a programming language. Instead of ones and zeros, A's, T's, G's, and C's. They want to use DNA to write simple, Lego-like functional components inspired by but not found in nature, and then run them in a cell instead of a computer. The only difference is this software builds its own hardware. They call this re-engineered genetic engineering synthetic biology. Nowadays, rather than cut and paste the DNA sequence out of one organism and into another, you can, if you know what you're doing, just type your DNA sequence into a computer or copy it from a database, or even select from a growing component catalog. And then you just order it over the internet. Yes, really. The DNA sequence may be copied from nature, but the DNA itself is made by a machine. It's synthetic. The raw material for synthesizing DNA is sugar. $25 of which will buy you enough to make a copy of every human genome on the planet. The chemical letters are fed into the DNA equivalent of an industrial inkjet printer. In goes your sequence information and out comes DNA at a cost of less than 40 cents per base pair and getting cheaper all the time. It's then freeze dried and shipped to your door. Already engineers have assembled an open source catalog of over 5,000 standardized components called BioBricks. At an annual worldwide do-it-yourself competition, university students build new and more complex biobricks, string them together, and then run them inside a much studied intestinal bacteria, E. coli. Sure, they're toy projects with shoestring budgets, but the results are impressive. E. chromi, an E. coli with sensitivity tuner and color generators is programmed to turn one of five colors when it detects a certain concentration of an environmental toxin. The E. coli is a bacterial system which switches on and off in response to red light. 
and acts like a bacterial Polaroid camera. Groups with more time and a lot more money are rewriting Polaroid and computer programming, refactoring old systems. Jay Keesling, chemical and biological engineer, and his team at UC Berkeley have built and continually refined a new metabolic pathway in yeast by assembling 10 genes from three organisms in an attempt to produce synthetically the anti-malarial drug artemisinin and to do it cheaply enough to treat up to 200 million malaria sufferers each year. Biotechnology pioneer Craig Venter has gone even further. His team has entirely replaced the DNA of one bacterium with a synthetic copy of DNA from another naturally occurring species and added a few extras, like their email address. This wasn't creating life. It was testing just how reprogrammable a bacterial cell can be. An important step if we want biological factories which can be tasked to make many things, like vaccine, medicine, food, and even fuel. In the last 10,000 years, genetics has taken us from gathering seeds to manipulating DNA. And engineering has taken us from rocks and caves to handheld computers and skyscrapers. We can only guess what the two working together as synthetic biology may help us achieve in the future. But the possibilities are breathtaking. Engineering algae that can eat climate changing carbon dioxide and produce less polluting biofuels. We might do away with both liver and kidney transplants and instead use a bat grown all purpose biological sieve organ called a cliver. We could change the nature of construction, architecture, urban planning, forestry, and even gardening with a seed that can grow into a house or even return life to a whole planet by terraforming the long dead Mars. Till then, synthetic biology advances project by project. As Drew Endy, civil engineer turned synthetic biologist says, testing of understanding by building is the shortest path to demonstrating what you know and what you don't. In so doing, synthetic biology is already paying dividends by simultaneously expanding and testing our knowledge of cellular function. Okay, so this is these are some of the possibilities. Um, in the video, they talked about um, this project called eChromite. So what this group of students did was mark a, a gene so that in case the gene detected, um, for example, that you had a rotavirus or salmonella or worms or colorectal cancer, then whenever that person pooped, the poop will come out with a certain color. So it's finding like a biosensor, right? So they did, they genetically modified bacteria that could act as biosensors. And what the person had to do was drink a yogurt. And then in case they didn't have anything, poop would just come with the same color. But in case it had something, it would change color. So I want to ask you, um, what are two considerations you think are important in this type of projects? Like what could go wrong? I think there's a lot of ethic in it. Mm -hmm. You can merge something to create something that you didn't expect and maybe you, it's the fear of creating the super villain, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, because people, what, what if my poop changes color? I don't know what to do. I just panic and, and, and it could become a problem and perhaps it's not, it's not a big deal, but, but we become scared because we're seeing our poop is changing color. But there's two things scientists have to take into consideration and it's specificity and sensitivity. So how specific are my genes? Are my genes really going to detect salmonella and not just another thing? That means specificity. And sensitivity is... How many bacteria, like how many salmonella cells do I have to have for my system to detect it? And is it going to be uh, like a really sensitive 
a method or maybe when I already have a lot of salmonella, it's when it's going to detect it that it's I already cannot do anything about it, right? But then it also it's how we communicate the product because we don't want people not to go to the doctor eh, because they say, oh no, my poop is perfect. I don't have to return to the doctor. I have stomach ache, but I don't know what, I, I should be okay. Maybe that could be a problem. But then it's how we market these things. Maybe for us adults, it doesn't really make sense. But for kids, sometimes children, babies, they cry and we have no reason why they cry. So if there, there could be something they would eat and then that if in case you see a change in color, consult a doctor without any panic, just consult a doctor. Maybe it could be a way how we could use biotechnology to communicate and to alert parents if that our baby has, has a stomach issue and that we should make some uh, tests and analyze it further. So there's, there's the biotechnology has a lot of possibilities, but it doesn't mean it can just go into the market like that because we could create a really huge problem with people out of diagnosing themselves or uh, having uh, taking antibiotics because they think they have a, a bacteria in themselves, that that could be a problem. So it has to uh, it has to be accompanied with a really good communication uh, strategy, and we need to know who is the 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 target. Like, are all human beings, or just kids, or just uh, adults, or whom? But the thing is, when you see something like this, some people say, no, that doesn't make sense. That is going to create problems. So every biotechnological development can be applied, but we have to think of how and whom and in what context should we be applying. Then there's biomimicry, which is this that we have talked about genetic engineering, fermentation, bioremediation, our biotechnologies. But now biomimicry is that practice of understanding, learning, and emulating strategies used by living organisms. And the idea is to create sustainable technologies. So there's two things in the biomimicry. One is the function. What is the role played by the adaptation, right? So for example, uh, the role is to protect from solar radiation or to get uh, to get water from environments that have like really scarce, scarce water scar scarcity. But then the biological strategy is the way in which the function is carried out, right? So one, one thing is the function and another thing is the biological strategy to accomplish that function. So these are two examples. If somebody has ever seen the lotus uh, leaf, it's amazing because you add water and the water just like it doesn't, um, it's hydrophobic. So the water doesn't, how do you say that? Doesn't homogenize with the tissue or something like that. It but, absorb it. Sorry? It doesn't absorb it. It doesn't absorb it. That's the word I was looking for. Yeah, it doesn't absorb it. So uh, people have engineered a paint wall, like for exterior paint, using that technology that the Lotus uh, leaf has to make a paint that is a uh, washable. So whenever it rains, the water droplets don't up, are not absorbed by the wall, but on the contrary, they fall, they fall. And when they're falling, they also carry with them the dust and everything that is attached to that paint. So it's an, a washable paint. Then there's also like flexible and self-repairing concrete, also learning of how nature can solve this thing. So there are some bacteria that you can add to concrete that are sleeping. And whenever these bacteria are in contact with water, they start to create a calcium carbonate and then they auto repair the, the walls. So in case you, you're wondering like, where can I find the solution? There's a really cool page called asknature.org. And you can ask nature a lot of different things. Like how does nature protect from from excess of, of CO2 in the environment or a certain toxin or how can how can how does nature um, help regulate temperature and then you can learn natural strategies to create art in an artificial way something that behaves like nature and lastly biodesign can also be used as a means to reflect so speculative design 
things that are not actually happening, but you can make believe people that it is happening. So for example, this was a project from the Biodesign Challenge where a group of, um, of people went and consulted a geneticist and they asked, okay, we are two working parents, mom and dad. Um, I don't have time to be pregnant and to have a child. Um, I want my child to have these characteristics. I want my child to be uh, immune to these diseases. I want him to have this uh, muscle type and whatever. And then they created a machine where actually the baby was being grown in this machine and the father and the mother could feel the baby kicking because they had these machines that when the baby kicked, you feel something. So the dad could also feel the baby kicking and you could just feed it with, with an artificial food that you put to the incubator so that baby could start growing. And the day the baby was ready to come out, both parents were there. They opened the machine and the baby comes out. So, so mothers don't have to stop their activity when they're pregnant. And this is something that is possible. Biotechnology allows this to be true. And I mean, they already created Dolly. You remember that uh, sheep that was created artificially in an artificial womb. So biotechnology allows us to do these things. But then this project makes you, through a, through a video, imagine that this was true so that you can start asking yourself, what are the things that could go wrong if, so, if, is the, if this was how society works? right? Because some people, uh, biotechnology sometimes doesn't have limits, but we as society have to put limits to that because then uh, things could go really wrong. If we could start creating kids and like not even having to be pregnant and not having to do so many things, there, there could be some things that, that could go wrong. So this is another area of biodesign that is really interesting that helps us reflect upon the what would be of society if we would employ apply everything that biotechnology had uh, for us and then finally i wanted to share this is a book which uh, here i'm showing it in spanish but it's also in english uh, it's biodesign for high schools or oh, you cannot see it because of my thing but i have a picture again so it's in English and in Spanish, and it's a book we wrote to, to share the biodesign methodology. And here's a render of how it looks. So it is not now. It has the design thinking methodology as a as, as the main, let's say the main uh, uh, line of the of the book so we start by by learning about context asking the proper questions and working with communities prototyping and and like that but there are places where you add biotechnology where you learn how to investigate and and to solve a problem something that is really important about design is how to ask questions so as a scientist we sometimes uh, from the beginning where we're going to solve something, we kind of know what we're going, where we're going to go out and uh, what we're going to find. Like I'm going to address whether um, a fungicide is more effective than another fungicide. And you kind of at the beginning know which one is going to work best, something like that. But in design thinking, whenever you ask a question, it's an open question. So for example, if I'm going to say I'm going to celebrate Annie's birthday, I'm going to do a birthday party to celebrate Annie's birthday. That will just lead me to a birthday party, right? But if I would ask, I want to celebrate Annie's birthday, perhaps it is a party, perhaps it is a special gift, perhaps it is um, watching a movie, or perhaps is a trip somewhere. There are a lot of different ways I could celebrate Annie's birthday, right? So it has, there has to be like, you have to ask a question that is open to multiple solutions. The solutions will come after the process, not from the beginning. And us humans were used to, for example, another example is I'm going to create a helmet to protect people's head when they're uh, biking in the streets. So that will take me to a helmet, helmet. But if I ask, I want to protect people's head when they're biking, perhaps the helmet is not the solution. I'll find other solutions. So this is how we should be asking our questions, really trying to know what is that we want to find and not how we want to find it. 
Then another problem is that we always have questions of what we want to address in our lives. But whenever you're asked, okay, find something you want to do, you're like, uh, I don't know where to start. So what this book has is three types of different questions. One is sustainable development goals. So you can look into the 17 sustainable development goals, one that you feel um, enthusiastic about. So for example, it could be health and well-being. Then you find a context or like like a context that could be a, a high school, university, or my neighborhood, or a country, or a city, or a rural area, something. And then users could be families, elderly, children, toddlers, eh, eh, the different type of users, right? The ones that make more sense. And then you can start asking questions like water needs that this type of people in this context have within the sustainable development goal. And you start brainstorming until you find something that you feel really happy and, and that you really want to, to solve. There's other things, energy, minority groups, and public spaces. This is, this is the book in English, and it also has examples of how to grow materials and of different biotechnologies you could do at home or apply in really simple, uh, with really simple equipments. And they also have the cards that, that I was mentioning in English. So in this course that we're going to be um, doing this week, the idea is for you to understand five different biotechnologies to understand how to read science papers, because something that I have found is an issue is that uh, many people always want to start from the beginning, but there's already a lot of information available. And in my case that I have been teaching designers, designers rarely look into scientific literature for references or for background. They look in a lot of different other sources, but not in the scientific or patents literature. And there is information that you can use to start building up a project or to start working on a solution. And you don't have to be scientists, but what it's important is that you understand the science so that you can work with scientists, so that you can work with engineers and be able to communicate with them on what is that you need them to do. What do you need them to solve? What do you need them to work on? But then you as a leader of a project have to understand what is the real problem? What do the people I'm working for need? What are they capable of doing? And involve them in the solution because it's the only way they are going to adopt that solution and actually make it work. Because it doesn't make sense for you to have a solution, to invest a lot of money in a solution if the people that need it are never going to have access to it, right? And maybe today it is expensive, but technology advances so fast. Imagine when cell phones came out. Very few people had cell phones. Today, almost everyone has cell phones, right? So maybe accessibility is shouldn't be a problem, but but it's but there's there's things you do have to take into account when you're designing. For example, if you want to design something that is reusable or that you want to give it a second uh, life, uh, you, you have to think of the of when you're creating that. For example, if I'm creating a, um, um, let's say, how do you say the tapete? Now I forgot the word, uh, rug, rug. If you're creating a rug and you want this rug to be reusable, uh, you have to think about what am I going to use as a glue? Because sometimes the glue is, is something that is toxic and that cannot be used. And maybe when I create my rug, I will create it with patterns. So if wine spills in the rug and the person wants to replace it, they don't have to replace the whole rug, which has changed colors because of the light or because of different uses. They could change that part. And because it has patterns, it wouldn't be as, as noticeable that you just changed it. So there's a lot of things that you have to think from the design of the project to make your product sustainable, to have a second life, to consider uh, what today we call waste as the raw material of a product you will produce in the future. And this is all called the circular economy mindset. Yeah, so I don't know, Josefina, if you want to stop now the recording so that, so that we can start talking like as a, as a group or...